Hello, and welcome to our Commerce Reimagined series, highlighting our visionaries, trailblazers, and the people who are changing the way we are defining innovation, technology, and commerce today. I am thrilled to welcome Jessica Spence to our Commerce Reimagined virtual stage. As we still be, do these virtually, one day we'll be together, I'm sure, having a drink. Uh, and we'll, that is a good segue, actually, to Jessica's role. She's the first president of brands. Um, in addition to end-to-end -end global brand strategy development and performance, Jessica has a full plate that includes leading global innovation, product research and development, emerging markets, technology, tools, and platforms, and integrated marketing communications and design. She previously served as a chief commercial officer at Carlsberg Group and led Carlsberg Global Marketing Sales Insights Research Development Innovation Functions. You've worked all over the world, Jessica, so I know we're going to draw from some of that global experience, including at the beginning of this pandemic where you found yourself not in the, not in the States or, or anywhere that I think you probably would have wanted to <laughs> to be situated. Um, you've also held agency side roles as well. So you bring that agency perspective from Leo Burnett and J. Walter Thompson. So let's start right there. First, let me welcome you. And then I'd love to start with like your role today is, is a, a bit different and um, quite special in nature. So I'd love to hear a bit about you and, and you know who you are in your career journey to date. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yes, it's been a, been an interesting career, I think. Um, as you said, I started out an agency, but um, relatively quickly, I moved into the drinks industry, um, first in beer across mainly Eastern Europe, um, some fabulous years working across Russia, Poland, Slovakia, uh, with SAB Miller at the time, one of the largest brewers, which of course became part of AB InBev. Um, then I moved to Carlsberg, um, was lucky enough to be based in Hong Kong, overseeing Asia. So a completely different environment, incredibly fast paced, um, you know, got very close to the China market, which is just phenomenal in terms of showing you a bit of what the future could look like, perhaps on some areas, particularly around digital, and then moved back to Copenhagen to take on the global role, um, which was a, a wonderful opportunity to, to be part of a new chapter of Carlsberg's growth. Um, and then moved to Beam Suntory just over a year and a half ago um, into a newly created role. And we were really trying to take what we have, which are some of, um, I unbiasedly would say the best brands in the category, um, all of which I think have a huge um, level of scope for growth, both in the US market, we're already strong in Japan, but also around the world. And I was tasked with standing up a team that could really run those brands as businesses. So it's not a traditional CMO role. I have some of the more traditional CMO um, remit, I guess, you know, when it comes to things like consumer insights, um, marketing technologies, elements like that. Um, but really the vision was these are brands that deserve to be run as business units with managing directors, with full PL accountability, because that's how we're going to be able to really maximize their potential globally and get them to the, the point they deserve to be given their incredible history. So I've been standing up that team um, during a pandemic, which was fun, um, mostly remotely, because um, as you mentioned, when the pandemic started, I was in a very different country to my husband and thought that was a priority. So I flew to Singapore and worked from there for nine months whilst leading a team I was standing up in the US. Um, and I'm now back here, but it's um, a, a wonderful chance to think differently about how you build brands. Um, and I think going beyond a traditional marketing scope, which I know a lot of companies are doing at the minute, they're all rethinking and reimagining chief marketing officers, chief growth officers. We've got a ton of different titles out there, but I think we're all really trying to understand how do you, how do you structure to maximize the value of your brands? I love though that you're living at the intersection of maximizing that value of brands thinking about marketing as one of the devices for doing that, but also with commercial responsibility and thinking about setting your brands up for long-term growth and commercial success and having all of that woven together, you know, with a lot of research and development and innovation too at the core of that. So that is, um, I think it's a great model, I think, for other companies right now that are trying to rethink this role. Yeah, I think it's brought huge value because I, I think the the need for the integration this was this was coming anyway but i think the pandemic probably speeded it up like it did many things the need for the integration across 
marketing and sales for those teams to think radically differently about how they interconnect um, is becoming so obvious and, and, you know, such a burning platform for all of us. And having this sort of brand house model enables you to think differently about that. And I think that's been, um, you know, we're very much at the early stages of working through that, like I think everyone is, but it does force you to think differently about the construct of what does it take for everyone in the organization to be a brand builder. Um, and for everyone to be united around that cause in all of the different channels and the ways that we now are able to reach our consumers. So with that goal in mind, your organization has done a lot to think about org design, org structure, and linking retail marketing and sales teams You know, to drive a more direct to consumer relationship model, to think about um, how do you operate to drive those kinds of results and outcomes. Talk to us a little bit about that internal org beyond even your role, but just how you're thinking about making those linkages that for some companies have been very difficult and challenging to make. I mean, first thing I say is we definitely are not all the way to bright. Um, this has been a, a really, it's a really tough one to think through. And I think it will continue to evolve as we go forward. I don't think anyone's got the solution. I think it's quite inspiring to look at people outside the category often. I think, you know, people retail, people who already had direct consumer relationships are perhaps further down the road than some of the more traditional consumer goods products. So we took a lot of inspiration from what's happening outside. I think what, what, what we're really trying to move to is a structure where um, we're talking about really managing the full brand experience and every single person, regardless of their role, having a responsibility for creating that. Um, I think you know, experience has become a bit of an overused word, worries me slightly. But at the end of the day, particularly in the drinks industry, we do sell experiences. That's always been the heart of what we do. And we have to recognize that every touch point that a consumer has with us, whether that's in the physical world or the digital world, is going to shape that experience. And what we're looking at at the minute is how do you organize around the ability to create the traffic that you need to create, the content you need to create, the, those commercial handoffs um, seamlessly. So the team are all working to the same goal. They're all working to the same management of the funnel. They've all got the same KPIs around that. And they're all able to create experiences which are absolutely seamless from a consumer's perspective and always give them that opportunity to, to close a sale. And I think that's been a, an interesting point with some of our, particularly you know, our more traditional marketing teams to say, okay, so this looks lovely, but where does a consumer go now? How do you close a sale? And they're like, well, that, that's sales job. And it's like, no, no, that's your job. Um, your job is, you know, how, did, how do you make it as easy as possible? How do you make it as seamless as possible? And equally talking to the sales teams about their role as brand builders. They're not there just to drive the traditional sales metrics. They are there to create an experience. And often they're closer to that than our marketeers are. So I think it's been a lot about reframing the expectations and the roles and then really starting to think through uh, the radical changes we've seen in how consumers are expecting to interact with our products. And as you say, the, the direct linkage and the direct relationship we want to have with them. So there sounds like there's a lot of joint accountability taking place, maybe even some internal empathy to use a softer word, where you're really trying to understand the pressures and the KPIs of, of areas that you probably weren't as close to um, before. Absolutely. Uh, and I, th I think empathy is a really good word, actually. I don't think it's soft at all. I think it's, um, you know, really strong empathy for how everyone else in the business needs to deliver and, and what their deliverables look like is, is absolutely critical. You don't get great teams working together without that. So I, I would I would put empathy very high up the list. It's not a word I've used with the team, but I think I'll take that one back and steal it. <laughs> by all means. So now bringing that empathy to your business, from my standpoint, I know if I were like dialing back to the beginning of the pandemic, and, and I think we were as you know, one of your partners feeling this for you of like, oh, wow, this is a category that we really didn't think about in terms of an e commerce channel, or even, you know, outside of big urban cities, a, a, you know, direct delivery, how do we get to consumers' doors when they need us and want us if they're not able to go into physical environments? And then even more, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but the experiential element of meeting people in bars, and that's where exploration and trial happens. But if I think about at the start, curious about, you know, your, you know, kind of if you were to rank yourselves in terms of readiness for this massive pivot you had to make, 
love to hear a little bit of your your um, reaction to that. And then talk to us a little bit about what did you do so quickly to make the most of the circumstances, discover and exploit new channels in new ways? Um, and then what were the insights that came from all of that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think in all transparency, I think our readiness was probably different in different parts of the world. And, and I think we all know the pandemic has played out quite differently in different areas. But um, if I take the US, I think we would all quite happily say we, we were not hugely ready for this. I'm, I'm not sure anyone was ready for, for the pandemic, but we were not as far ahead as I would love to, us to have been when, when that hit. And we were we didn't have we had a lot of scenarios of how we thought it might play out but we didn't have a we didn't have a roadmap we didn't have certainty we were very unsure about the way the market was going to develop um and i think what was what was incredibly impressive though was the speed that the organization was able to move at um in a way i, I always feel guilty for saying this but i think that the change that we drove through the pandemic would have taken years um to make happen even though it was all of the right things for us to be doing um, but I think the way that we mobilized um, created a lot of new relationships with new e-retailers, particularly incredibly fast. The way that we moved our resources, um, obviously what we found very quickly was we have a lot of resources servicing the on-trade, so the bars, the restaurants, the pubs, and they weren't open. Mm -hmm. um, and our ability to take those people and say, right, we're going to redeploy them, we're going to retrain them, we're going to give them different types of roles that play into where the business is going at the minute, we didn't know how temporary versus permanent that was going to be, but the speed that the organization was able to do that was incredibly impressive. And um, we saw that in our numbers, mm -hmm. uh, the, the shift to e-commerce. And I think uh, for me, it, it reminded me a lot of what we saw in SARS um, in Asia, where again, that was a really pivotal turning point for e-commerce. Um, and so we, we had some idea that that pattern could repeat itself. And I think that's definitely what we saw playing out across the US and Western Europe in particular, was that huge uptick. Um, and also the creation of, of new offerings. Um, you know, I think as an industry, it's incredibly impressive to see how on-trade outlets have pivoted to delivery, to pre-mixed cocktails, how legislation shifted to make that possible for them. And I think what was incredibly important for us as we went through the pandemic was um, constantly working with scenarios and constantly having the ability to turn on a dime when we needed to, when things went in a direction, bluntly often we didn't see coming. Um, so readiness low, agility, I would say incredibly, I was incredibly proud. Well, demand clearly high. So with, with that understanding, um, tell us a little bit about like, did you discover through your consumer insight De new demand spaces, new need states, new things that emerge based on people's lifestyles and routines changing? Um, I mean, I think broadly, when, when we looked at our, uh, we, we were tracking the demand spaces. So we kicked off a few weeks after the pandemic hit, we kicked off a tracker to actually say, uh, where are people drinking? Why are they drinking? Has this changed? And we tracked that across four cities globally. What was really fascinating was um, the, the, the core cool needs didn't change. Uh, the reasons people feel like having a bourbon or a gin and tonic stay pretty constant, but the shape of the kind of map of their motivations and needs really shifted. People needed a lot more of like um, a reset. That was mm -hmm. a big thing we heard. I mean, it was wonderful. The people, when we talked to them about how are you thinking about having a drink now? And they were like, it's replaced my commute. We were like, okay, that's a little weird. Um, and when they talked through that, it made complete sense. They were saying, my day is featureless. I don't move. I don't go outside the house. Um, my kids don't go to school. I'm living in this very flat world. And I just need something to mark a point in time when I stop work mm -hmm. and I need to decompress. And I don't necessarily, it's not like I'm having three drinks. I just need a moment to, to, to pivot, to say, I'm now off duty, or I'm now doing something else. So what we saw was some things like, you know, that kind of reset moment coming through very strongly, obviously a kind of, you know, the need to just unwind, kick back, that coming through. But the social, um, you know, some of the social spaces remained strong, mm -hmm. whether that was happening virtually or with, you know, smaller groups, but those needs were still absolutely there. Mm -hmm. um, and what was interesting was we saw people, we, we predicted that they might downtrade. You know, you're at home, nobody's looking at you. Why, do you. why do you buy the expensive bottle? And people were absolutely not doing that. They were like, I'm not going on holiday. I'm not going to restaurants. I want that treat. Right, right. So all of those indulgence moments, they came through really strongly. So 
the map stayed the same, but the sizes of them within it really did shift around. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I could imagine that that desire for premium for quality, this was the thing that they probably would want to put their, you know, money or, you know, their indulgence in. So yeah. there was so much you couldn't spend your money on. This was something you still could. Exactly. Um, and if you, you know, just if you thought no one was looking, well, you're just in some ways just cheating yourself. And this was a chance to actually, you know, do something for yourself to your point about the space that it served. So when you think about the content strategy that then has to shift to align to all those other changes and, and usage patterns, and then also people's content um, behaviors changing and moving almost wholly online into different content channels than perhaps before, what, what did you do differently? How did you make that kind of a shift in organizationally to keep up even? That was, that was huge because for us, you know, I think when most people think about quote content, they think about, you know, video content or posts or things like that. that they're putting, or, you know, even TV ads or out of home. When we thought about it, we said, well, you know, a huge amount of our content is in-person connection. Um, our content is the story a bartender tells you when they serve you the drink or the way the brand shows up on the menu um, in the cocktail that it's served in, or it's the glassware that it's given in because that makes the whole moment special or it's a, you know a lot of events that we do um so our content was always very heavily reliant on in person um and we know that that's one of the strongest touch points we had and that was gone mm -hmm. um you know big events those are out you know big moments where we do a lot of sponsorship those are gone bartenders weren't able to hand over that cocktail in the same way in the same same manner so we thought very hard about how can we replicate some of what was amazing about those moments in a digital way. And I think actually it's been incredibly liberating for us because whilst all of those in-person content moments are so powerful, they're by definition hard to scale um, and hard to control. Um, you know, the one-on-one -on -one bartender moment is wonderful, but maybe that bartender talks to 100, 150 people in an evening. Um, all of a sudden we found that by trying to think about, well, what would that look like as a digital experience? We just got this phenomenal reach opportunity. And I think it's been a real game changer across the industry for us as we suddenly have realized, perhaps a bit belatedly, that a lot of that content, that very human touch content, um, is very easy to do online. And in some ways, even better. You know, when we would do a tasting previously, we could maybe do it for 20 people. We now can do tastings for 2,000 people. And they feel intimate. They are using our bartenders, our brand ambassadors, who are phenomenal with people. And we're just putting them on a stage and giving them, um, you know, giving them a platform. And I think it really moved our thinking from thinking historically when we were creating pieces of content, we were almost in quite an old school mindset of making them perfect. You know, this is the one beautiful, pivotal piece of content we'll roll out to every market. It will be the perfect 30 second, five second, ten, you know, and we put a lot of energy into production values. And I think what we realized is humanity and you don't need to be quite as dumb. You don't need to be quite as produced. Um, you need to be present. You need to be engaging. You need to be very conversational. And the interactivity became really critical for people. And that was a real breakthrough for us. Um, and I think that's something that we will absolutely keep um, because it's just, it transforms how we think about the number of people we can give that special moment to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, everything that you're saying really resonates even from a consumer point of view, not just as a marketer, just thinking about things that created a little bit more intimacy that maybe weren't refined and perfect always, mm -hmm. but it was more speed to be relevant, to be on top of a moment that you know started to make sense for the brand and for the consumer. Um, and bringing those together in a way that felt, to your point, it was there was a genuineness, and authenticity to it that maybe wasn't reached before because it felt like you always felt like it was marketing. And um, so I think that the brand got real benefit from being in this environment in this way. So you also have, uh, you know, innovation and, um, you know, product development and things like that in your remit and your, you know, in your capacity. So when you think about this time period, usually, again, you do use the bar and the physical environment for exploration and introducing and getting a consumer comfortable with um, maybe you've experienced it there. And then you can start thinking about, okay, what does that mean if I start to take it into my home? So you, you know, when you're thinking about some of the newer things that you've done in terms of formats, or packaging or, you know, simpler cocktails and standbys at home. Talk to us a little bit about how all of that has changed and how you've thought about 
channels differently from on-premise, off-premise, and e-com? And how will that continue to, you know, inform how you work in the future? That's a, that's a really great question. I mean, I think from from a from a product perspective, um, obviously one of the big stories has been just the, the huge explosion in kind of ready to drinks and ready to serves. And I think there was already a move in that direction, um, but this really opened consumers' minds up. I think they they kind of had seen those as perhaps not as high quality, not as crafted. And all of a sudden when you don't have a choice, but also when some of your most amazing bars in the world are doing these incredible things you can get delivered, that was a real mindset shift and a mind opener because whilst everyone will tell you that they love making cocktails at home and they're super into it, there are some people who are, but most people are just a little bit too lazy. Um, or, you know, you love the idea and then you get home and you realize you don't have the right bitters or there's this one ingredient missing. So um, that ability to access and be open to really high quality ready to serve. And we have a, a brand called On The Rocks, which is just doing amazingly because they are, the vision for that was always to bring the bar to you and to give you that craft cocktail moment at home. And I think the openness to people to try that um, really uh, has skyrocketed. And, and we think that will continue because it does just give you a, a fantastic way um, with ease, with convenience, with all of those drivers consumers are looking for of accessing that kind of experience. Um, but I think it's also made us really think about the join up, as you say, across the channels. Um, you know, if I'm being honest, our model was always you recruit very much through the on-trade, the bartender tells you the beautiful story, you remember the cocktail, you're next in a, in a liquor store, you see the pack and you trigger something, you think oh, I'll take that home and make it. We were kind of relying on a lot of serendipity for that to happen. Um, and, you know, when you think, well, how many consumers actually come through that journey? And why did we never handhold them better? Why did we never help them? Why did we never give them the option and trigger them when they're in the bar to scan something, to go to a quick buy now, to have that option um, and actually join those all up. And I think that's what it really forced us to do is when we had that on trade taken away from us and we had to rethink the consumer journey, um, it really did push us to, and I mean, it's, it's pushing us now, we're not there yet, to, to stop thinking online versus offline, on trade versus off trade. Um, you know, it, it's forced us to become a lot more consumer centric and think about how do we make that journey as easy as possible for them? How do we give them the trigger uh, to be excited or interested in the brand in the right way? But then how do we make that purchase experience seamless wherever they want that to come from? And that I think would have taken us a lot longer to get to without the disruption of the last year, because it, it took that key channel being taken away from us to force the creativity to think differently. And are you doing things now to codify and capture what you're learning so that you don't lose that as you as things will return to, I hate the word normal now, but to what comes next? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's one of the things that will stay. And, and that's something that we're we're now incredibly committed to is this idea of um, you know, the 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 joined up experience that we're going to create. So becoming truly consumer centric and thinking about how to give them the options to both discover, explore, engage, and purchase um, wherever they are and, and whenever it's relevant to them. Um, and I think that's become much more of a mantra in the business in terms of how we're thinking about brand planning, connections planning, embedding the consumer journey, embedding e-commerce much more into our annual planning cycle, which if I'm being honest before, it was an afterthought. Um, I think it's becoming absolutely central. It's almost where a lot of the plans are now starting from. And that that's an interesting thing, which I think a lot of people are going to see being a, a fundamental capability shift as we go forward and, and a huge, you know, I hate to say it, but benefit coming out of a lot of the, the pain and the trauma of the last year. So this next question is, a, you know, more of a corporate question. And then I'm going to move into a little bit more of a personal from your leadership perspective question to end on. But when you think about the move to New York now, not just for yourself personally, but for the whole organization, um, what do you see the benefits of being in a city like New York? It's, it's interesting. The headlines are sometimes daunting, but the reality in that I found since, you know, really being immersed back in New York outside of our apartments is a renaissance. You know, it has always been a happening city, but I think even right now it feels like we're on the cusp of the next new New York so I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what you think will be the benefits for, for a business like Beam Suntory. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's been a, it's been a very big decision for us. Uh, it's one that we 
um, you know, had to take in the middle of the pandemic and, and it did feel quite counterintuitive. People sort of kept saying, really? Good time to move to New York. <laughs> but I think when we looked at it, you know, we, we've got a phenomenal team based in Chicago and they've been doing an amazing job. But I think, you know, the business is, has clearly set out a, a different level of global ambition. And I think when you look at it and when you look at, um, you know, what it takes to build global brands, there still are a set of global cities which are super interconnected, which do make a difference. And New York is clearly, um, you know, one of those. And I think our feeling was that actually being being close to that uh, for our global team, our, our North America teams remaining in Chicago, but for our global team was incredibly important. And I think it was it was interesting because we, as I said, you know, we we made this move at a time when a lot of people were predicting the death of the city. And they were saying, yeah, you know, and it was London was dying, New York was dying, San Francisco, they were all they were all over. We we're all going to move to the countryside. Um, and I think there was, we're already seeing that is not the case. I think the creativity that you get in in big cities, which has been a driver for centuries, um, the consolidation of talent that you can get, the international, in the case of New York, what was interesting for us, those global connections. Those are incredibly strong. Um, and I think, you know, the, the demise of New York, I think, is much exaggerated. I, I have the same feeling. I think it's going to come back. And I think actually there is an opportunity to address some of the, the challenges that the city had before the pandemic um, and to reinvigorate some areas. And it's, it's great to see also some of the big tech companies investing in New York. I think there's a lot of people who are, who are actually betting positively on New York now and the role it's going to continue to play. Well, we welcome you here and we look forward to even personally, um, literally toasting you here. So um, from a personal standpoint, this has been an uh, interesting, challenging, trying time um, as, a, as individuals, but as leaders as well. And you do feel the weight and the responsibility of your teams on your shoulders. I know I do. And I know from talking to you, Jessica, you do. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, introspection that you had, insight that you gained, how, how do you think you're, you've become a bit of a different leader or a different person through this time period? God, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think one of the first things for me, and I, you know, one of the things I'd say is I, I, I've been incredibly proud of how the company has navigated this. And I think that's true of a lot of companies. I think companies have actually really stepped up in a lot of cases for their people. And it's been phenomenal to see. Um, on a personal level, I think what it, it really brought home to me was the importance of, of authenticity. Um, this was a year where there were days when I couldn't show up at my best. Um, you know, I'm, America's very interesting as somebody arriving here culturally, there's this very strong feeling of bringing your best self to work and being at your best. And there's quite a lot of pressure on that. And I think this was a good year for us to just all realize, you know, I don't have that in me today. Um, with what's going on, whether it was for a lot of my team, managing kids, whether it was managing distance from family, inability to connect to the people we care about or be there for the people we care about. You know, for a lot of people, whether that was the reality of COVID, whether that was illness or trauma and, and grief around that. And I think in a weird way, the pandemic has freed us up to be okay um, and gave me the confidence as senior to just turn up and sometimes say to my team, I just need to be transparent. I'm not in a great place today. I'm gonna do my best. And, you know, I'm, I'm here for you, but I've just got to be realistic about that. And it's better that we're honest about that. And I think that's actually been really powerful for teams because I think there's something healthy about recognizing that not every day is a great day and not every day you're going to be on your, on your sparkly best form. And sometimes you just need a minute. Um, and if it's taught us that that is acceptable, that that is something that is part of being a senior leader that you don't have to be invincible that you don't have to be perfect every time that's that's huge and that that's potentially really positive for us so I think for me that that was one piece and the other was just um it, it really taught me about the importance of understanding people's lives um understanding how people were going through this in such different ways with such different pressures and realizing and I think this is going to be critical when we think about the future of work that we can't force people into one model of what a working life should look like, what a career should look like, what a work week should look like. Um, people have so many different pulls on their time, so many different concerns, so many different things they're juggling. 
and the flexibility that we need to show to that, I think has really been brought home to us. And I, I really hope that that has been a wake up call for, for corporates, because if we don't adjust, we will lose top talent. Um, if we don't demonstrate that empathy, that flexibility, that humanity, we will not be able to attract the best of the best. Um, so that that was the second big one for me. Well, from, you know, thinking about employees and colleagues as people to our consumers as people, a lot of the same kinds of themes and this notion of, you know, imperfect, um, much more authenticity, much more vulnerability being brought into our content, into our dealings with each other and how a brand shows up, which, you know, I really, you know, appreciate about what you're saying. And I hope that to your points, all of this is being codified and, you know, really, you know, because it's so easy sometimes to have these incredible insights and then to lose them so quickly as things begin to shift and change. So how do we recognize that some of these lessons and learnings and surfacings that we've had uh, really inform how we should be thinking about the future and hold on to those things that have really changed and transformed the way we're going to think and approach our work? Yeah, I think that's critical because I think the what terrifies me, is, and I say it myself, is when people say, oh, well, when things go back to normal, I'm like, you know, I don't know if they go back to normal. I don't, I think it goes to something that will feel a lot more wonderful, but I don't think it goes back to normal, quote. And I think us being very clear eyed about what has fundamentally changed versus what was some, just a temporary shift um, is, is going to be critically important. And I think we're still working that out. And I love that your brands actually play a role in that too. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do um, as a leader and as someone who's is now overseeing, you know, such st strong brands um, and re you know, redefining how they show up in our lives. We really love this conversation with you, Jessica. And I know that people who now have been sparked to, you know, the conversation and who you are can find you on LinkedIn and um, ping, like start to, to follow you and um, reach out. They have more that they want to learn from you. So Jessica Spence, Beam Suntory, you know, again, fantastic to spend this time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much.